So this afternoon, uh, we have the pleasure of having a, a person that I've known for a lot of years, uh, Paula Menzies is uh, being with us. Paula is, as most of you know, um, a veterinarian and a strong supporter of research in the sheep world and has supported us over the years. She is retired, but is actively uh, involved in the international scene in uh, uh, in sheep disease as she's been for a lot of years. So I'll give the, the microphone to Paula and thank you for being here. Thanks a lot, John. Um, yes, we were both young <laughs> at one point. That was a long time ago. Um, I wanna thank uh, everybody for inviting me uh, here today to talk about Made Vista. Um, it's, uh, it's a disease that I've worked with for a long time with Ontario sheep farmers. And um, I wish I could say we didn't have to worry about it anymore, but that would be a lie. Um, so Mady Visna is the same disease as ovine progressive pneumonia. They tend to call it OPP in the US and in Western Canada and Mady Visna in the rest of the world. Um, it's exactly the same virus, although obviously there could be some strain variation, but it's pretty minor. Um, so what do we see in a flock? It's usually adult sheep. I mean, it's almost exclusively adult sheep. It doesn't usually show up at less than three years of age, um, but it's right at the peak of a ewes expected productivity. That's when we start to see clinical signs. And the most common clinical sign is respiratory disease. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Exercise intolerance where affected sheep may, may lag in the flock. Now there's other reasons for that as well, but that's definitely one reason. Uh, sometimes we may see neurologic disease, certainly less common, but most commonly it's hard udders, and it's most uh, commonly detected at lambing. The, but it's often unrecognized, or it's blamed on something else. So a lot of flocks could have matey, but not know it. So that's the video that didn't load. Unfortunately, it's sheep with matey visna, and I apologize. Um, I do have a video clip that did work in the last presentation, so hopefully that'll help. Mady Visna is caused by a virus, but it's a very kind of different virus. It's called a small ruminant lentivirus. Caprine arthritis encephalitis, or CAE, is sort of in the same family, and so they often get called small ruminant lentiviruses together. But they are different viruses. Um, lenti just means slow because it takes years of infection to see evidence of disease. And... Um, it's some important things to know about the virus. Sheep are infected for life. It's very, very uncommon for them to cure the infection. Um, they can get reinfected. Uh, being infected doesn't mean they don't get infected again. Uh, it's very contagious, sheep to sheep. It's mostly found in the white blood cells. So the virus isn't free, and this is what this picture is supposed to show, is that's a, a, a white blood cell, and the virus used the cell to replicate and bud off um, and go off and infect new cells. Um, the virus cannot be killed by the sheep's immune system. It's shed in the respiratory secretions and in the milk, and it's mostly, almost entirely, it's within the white blood cells that end up in the respiratory secretions or milk. It can live up to eight days in the environment. It, it's pretty fragile but it doesn't die right away. So this is from a study we did 10 years ago or more um, uh, in flocks in Ontario. And we had several, I think we visited 12 flocks and then we typed out the virus, the strains of virus of Mady Visna that were in the different flocks. And you can see genetically there is variety. And it's so in a flock, it can kind of change over time. Um, probably doesn't change how the test detects it, and it doesn't change the disease it causes, but it just shows that this virus is pretty smart and it keeps trying to figure out ways to avoid the immune system. It's widespread throughout the world, except Australia and New Zealand, although we can solve that problem, we can just send it to them. They'd really appreciate that maybe. Flocks mostly become infected through the in, in introduction of infected animals. And so this can happen from purchasing replacement stock 
borrowing an animal that's going to, and of course, the longer it's in the flock, the more risk there is of transmission. It could be picked up at a show that which is again, a shorter time period. It is impossible to pick it up. Um, we don't do a lot of pasture sharing here, but in other parts of the world, they do have a lot of community pastures. So that's another way the infection can be spread. Within an infected flock, on average, we usually see uh, in an average flock, 20 to 40% of the animals test positive. Although I have lots of examples of higher proportions, um, up to 90 to 100%. You know, it's the good news, bad news. The good news is, you know, sheep E24 is negative. And then the bad news is everybody else is positive. It happens um, because it is so uh, contagious. And certainly uh, intensively reared flocks, those fl housed indoors usually have higher levels of infection. Here in Canada, there aren't that many flocks that don't have part of the time of the year inside. The level of infection increases with age and that's simply because the longer you use in the flock, the more likely she is to be exposed. Young animals less likely to be uh, infected, obviously. Um, but it's definitely a common infection depending on how the animals are managed by five years of age. So this slide, the intent, oh, it's very dark. Why is it so dark? Um, is there a reason for the slide to be so dark up on the screen? Okay, so what this is in trying to show you is this is a cross section, sorry, this is a cross section through a lung. This is uh, one of the airways. This purple mass here is white blood cells, um, particularly and specifically lymphocytes, and they're blue. And I'll show you what that means in a second. What happens is the disease is chronic inflammation. So the virus lives very happily uh, inside a type of cell called a macrophage, which is one of the white blood cells that we have. These macrophages are made in, a, in the bone marrow. If they, and they get recruited to go out and do their job of protecting the animal from disease. So there's like constant waves of these macrophages going out and doing their job, identifying things that just shouldn't be in the body and trying to kill them. Macrophage means big eater in it's Latin, and they eat and they don't know what they're eating, but they know it's not supposed to be there. Um, but they are they're also infected with medivisna when they go out to the tissues, the white the lymphocytes say, I know what you are and you don't belong here. And they come running in there to try and kill the infected macrophages. And it's these attacks, this wave and wave of attacks that cause the inflammation. And so it's an endless loop. You got, so the, the white blood cells, the lymphocytes come in and they proliferate. And because of the inflammation, we get scarring. And over the years, this scarring gets worse and worse and worse. And then the sheep starts to sh show signs of disease. And that's how Medivisna does its job. The target tissues, mammary gland, lungs, and last common uh, central nervous system, and the joints. So this is the video that shows a ewe with chronic pneumonia. This is a ewe from a dairy flock. There's two of them um, that we took out of a flock that had a very, very high proportion of the uh, sheep test positive. These animals are usually pretty bright and alert. They don't tend to have a fever. They may still have a not bad appetite. It's usually reduced. They lose condition. You can see these girls are thin. Um, they cough a lot. They cough and cough and cough like I might do if I don't drink water sometimes. Um, and of course, they, they lag at the back of the flock. You can treat them with any antibiotic you have. They are not going to get better. They just progress and then um, 100% fatal. This is uh, some lovely pictures on um, postmortem, and it, what this lung is, it, sorry, this lung is from a U that we, the owner um, brought her to a, a, a lab um, on thin use. This is actually in, from Manitoba a few years ago, and I'll, he was, she was just a bit thin. He didn't know what was wrong with her, didn't recognize her being sick. Her lungs probably weigh three times what a normal lung would weigh and about one and a half times as big and they're just full of inflammatory cells. And it's worse at the top. Like normally when we see bacterial pneumonia, it's down here. 
but here it's all along the top and they're kind of tan colored instead of normal pink color. And I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there's lots of mucus in the trachea as well. So, um, and this cross section here is from another U. And again, it's dorsally at the top of the lung, it's just solid um, from these inflammatory, chronic infl inflammation. So different than your typical pneumo bacterial pneumonia that you may see in your lambs. The other um, organ that gets affected is the udder. And it's not our typical um, bacterial mastitis where you get lumpy udders and abnormal milk. And on studies where they've done biopsy on normal appearing udders, that 30 to 50% of these sheep and infected flocks have damage to the udder from the virus. And this picture at the bottom here, again, it's supposed to show, instead of having lots and lots of milk producing alveoli in there, it's scar tissue uh, caused by the chronic inflammation. So what do you feel? It's uniformly hard to the touch, it's not hot. Um, the milk looks normal, it's the, um, it isn't lumpy, um, the, um, the negative on CMT and milk culture. Um, the lambs, of course, aren't getting enough milk, so they're hungry, they don't grow well, they may even starve, depending on how severe it is. They steal more from other ewes. Um, they may need to try to eat more creep um, to compensate if it's available. And there might be some biting going on, um, perhaps risk of bacterial mastitis. Less common diseases that we see then are the neurologic form. This, this photo here is of a, of a U in Spain where they had a big outbreak of neurologic disease um, uh, in, in these dairy flocks, and it turned out to be medivisna. Um, and also arthritis, and I would say that we don't have a good idea how common that is, but some arthritis may be due also to medivisna. So we're here to talk about flock productivity. There is good evidence that seropositivity is associated with um, reduced reproductive performance, early culling of adults, reduced milk production, reduced lamb growth and survival. Even when you don't see a lot of clinical disease in the flock, the virus is costing you money. That's probably one of the biggest messages that I can give. So a few studies, some of these are old, but the virus didn't change much and neither did the sheep. But so the studies I think are still valid. A study that was done in Canada back in the eighties showed that reproductive performance on uh, the seropositive ewes were only two thirds as likely to lamb. Another study done in the US um, actually found it worse. Um, where the seropositive views were only half as likely to lamb as seronegative views. Milk production. There's been more recent research on this. This first paper is out of Spain with the Laxta breed, and they found that overall they had thousands and thousands of dairy sheep records that made up this data set. It was an amazing data set. 6.7% lower milk production seropositive versus seronegative. These are, again, healthy-looking sheep. Um, they worst uh, went up to 12% less for those ewes that were in their second to fourth lactation, keeping in mind that in a flock, those are supposed to be the most productive ewes. Um, they estimated um, in this paper a cost per ewe per year of 50 euros. So uh, the conversion, um, when I put the slides together, was $1.46 Canadian dollar for every euro. So you can kind of... Um, one and a half times that 50 euros, so 75 Canadian dollars. And they, they, their conclusion was it's these, these production losses alone from milk, to say nothing of all the other losses that might be happening, is definitely worth a testing call program. Milk production, um, this, these are breeds that are more commonly used in Canada. Um, if this study was done in the UK, um, they found a higher milk production loss, 8.1 to 9.2%. Again, the third and oh, oh, um, third plus lactation use were more affected. Um, the somatic cell counts, a measure of mastitis, not different. So um, again, healthy production sleep. Going back to the DeHu study in 1987, uh, lambs um, from born to seropositive views had lower birth weights, and uh, they at 50 days, they were lighter. 
that that makes sense if the ewes aren't producing as much milk or they're thin. Uh, we did a study a long time ago and we found a very similar type of finding, but at 100 days. Um, so even they hadn't yet compensated even after weaning. Um, a, a nice study that was done in Quebec a few years ago found that lambs born to seropositive ewes were 1.65 times more likely to die. And again, they were lighter um, if they were rate four plus U's, again, the ones that are most likely to be clinically um, affected, um, raised lighter lambs. So my favorite study was a, a really lovely one done in the US that I referred to already, Keen et al. Um, and he enrolled quite a large number of flocks, so a huge variety of management systems and breeds. And he found um, losses just at every step along the uh, productivity cycle on these ewes. But I found his one number very useful in that he, these, a seropositive ewe raised just under five kilos less lamb than a seronegative. And that includes um, all, all, all the parameters, the reproductive performance, the survival and the growth. So, um, and I find that very useful when it's considering whether it's affecting your flock. So transmission. Um, transmission is done pretty well completely from the secretions with virus infected cells. Um, most infection is animal to animal or within a very short timeline, perhaps feeders and waters, um, particularly say dairy ewes that are fed in the parlor, that we have feeders in the parlor. Um, most infectious to least infectious respiratory secretions, just way up there. And these are droplets, not aerosols. Um, and so usually short distances in the air, um, and, uh, but it can be transmitted, say, from the ewe to lamb from grooming, for example. Um, but, but again, in our intensively reared housing where we have some high stocking densities uh, in some parts of the barn, then it's quite easy to transmit. Um, it can also um, be found in the colostrum and in the milk, but less likely to infect. Not that it can't, but it's just less likely. In utero transmission, the research says one in 10 lambs born to a seropositive ewe will be infected. It seems a bit high to me, but, it, but the, it, it's not zero. So there is a risk of a lamb being born infected. Um, blood contaminated instruments and needles, probably not really very important in transmission. Not zero, but probably not the most important way. Um, and semen has been found in semen where there's also inflammation, say from epididymitis or whatever. So probably in a healthy ram, it's not a big issue. What is a big issue is when that ram is running around breeding ewes, he's producing a lot of respiratory droplets. Um, and so that's probably where the infection is happening from the ram more than from the semen. So one UK study, and this kind of blows my mind, but one UK study estimated that the virus is transmitted 1,000 times faster in house sheep than in sheep raised extensively in pasture. And so again, it goes back to how are we managing our sheep? We are in a perfect storm with opportunity for that virus to be transmitted sheep to sheep. And going back to what I talked about, the proportion of seropositivity we often find in the flock, it 20 to 40%, as could be much, much higher, that fits very well with how we tend to manage our flocks. So there is, of course, genetic susceptibility. It's not nice and neat like scrapey, but it is another route for producers to explore if they want to reduce susceptibility of the sheep to the virus. And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but I'll try to explain. The gene that's been identified is called the TMEM154 gene. And there are at least three haplotypes. There may be more, but three that we worry about and probably two. Um, and, and sorry, there is an additional one that is less important. Um, so haplotype two and three, most sheep in an unselected population are um, haplotype two or three, and they are associated with increased susceptibility. Haplotype one is 
uh, if the animal is carrying two copies of the gene, they're much less susceptible to infection. If they're only carrying one copy, it doesn't seem to convey that much resistance. Haplotype 4 is a very uncommon haplotype, and those animals appear to be much less susceptible to infection as well, but there tends to be some breed effect. Um, that's probably, I'm way oversimplifying it. So really we're focusing on two and three and one. So if you wanted to use these genetics, to con you've got made it in your flock, but you wanna breed it out, then you would definitely wanna use rams that are homozygous for one, and ideally uh, work towards having your ewe flock um, homozygous as well. So that means having them at least carry one copy of the one gene in there so that you can test and, and get rid of all the um, twos and threes for sure. It isn't fast, it isn't probably cheap, but it can be done and it is a tool. So mostly we use the immune response to find virus infected sheep. And how long after infection does that animal seroconvert? Well, at least two weeks, but it can be a long time before they do. Um, and what's interesting, is that the virus is got a lot of different antigens in it and the animal produces antibodies to different parts of the virus at different type times of infection. So some are really fast and some are really slow. So that influences what test we use to find these animals. None of these antibodies that the animals producing kill the virus. There are a few animals and I hate them, um, that have no antibody response because they can still transmit the virus to other animals. Um, the antibody response can vary over time. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, things that will lower the, the antibody response is if the animal's immunologically stressed. So we think about late, uh, pregnancy or early lactation as being obvious times when a positive animal can temporarily turn negative. Um, obviously, if they're de nutritionally debilitated or debilitated for another reason, that can also do it. So we worry about, um, for example, Yoni's disease, um, maybe uh, causing false negatives. Um, but in one study, 10% of animals that apparently were otherwise healthy uh, changed their serologic status over a year. And this is incredibly frustrating because we want, we want cleanness in our pro programs and biology isn't clean. So if a, she, if a lamb nurses a positive view, those colostral antibodies are usually gone by about three months of age and definitely gone by six. The test that we use in our program has the excellent ability to detect this immune response, has what we call a very, very high sensitivity. So at 98, 99%, really, really good test. Can we detect the virus? Well, and unfortunately it's difficult. The virus is inside the infected cells, almost all of it. There's very little free virus. Um, we can't, we can't, there are tests out there. They're uh, PCR tests and they're usually done on whole blood or tissues at post-mortem. Um, when they're done on tissues, they work pretty well, but they don't work that great when they're done on whole blood. And we usually say that um, the PCR test is about 10% less sensitive than, um, than the serologic test. Uh, and we wish we had a better test uh, that had very high sensitivity, but I haven't, I mean, there's lots of papers published, but I haven't seen any magic bullet yet. I'm waiting, I'm hoping. So we work on trying to lower the risk the flock's risk, and I should say this, that we're talking about lowering risk or creating a low risk as opposed to eradication, which I know can be very frustrating, but I hope you understand from the nature of the virus that this is a tough guy to completely eliminate with certainty. We are, do our best, but it isn't without frustration. So the idea is to find those animals that are have a serologic response uh, and are most likely infected Remember, they're not, they're not immune, they still have the virus in them and get them out. So we wanna use a test with high sensitivity. 
and we want to repeat testing because we're not going to catch all the positives because some animals may have just gotten infected the day before we test and that's why we have to go back in and test again um we have selected six months to start the initial screening test because we're sure that they don't have colostral antibody and we're catching them early enough so that um, if we waited till they were a year of age, then they might be able to shed, be infected and shed the virus for 18 months. Um, we want to make sure that we screen anybody coming into the flock. And um, while they're in isolation, two negative tests, eight to 12 weeks apart, well, that's imperfect because there are some of those animals may seroconvert later, but we're trying to balance what is possible with what is best and um, and if, and I know when we first started working on this program, we said, whoa, six months, it's got to do six. Well, nobody can take that. And I also know that this is one of the, the issues in the program is that when people need animals like rams, you need them today and not two months from now or three months from now. Um, and then, of course, we have to continue monitoring the flock to see if the status is unchanged because of biosecurity issues or those nasty late serial converters. So I'm not gonna walk, spend a lot of time walking through the, the program, um, except that probably uh, maybe some of you in the audience haven't seen it before, but we, we start with qualifying tests for enrolled um, if there, we don't get in, and we're testing everybody that's six months and older in the flock, including any goats that are in there because of CAE. And if they're all negative, then we call them enrolled negative. If there's positives, they need to leave, um, go to market. And we used to require that lambs less than six months of age go because, because of the increased risk. Now we say it's recommended rather than required. And I can talk about why that is, but it's it's really about risk, the, the risk of a lamb born to a seropositive ewe in one study in the Netherlands, was it was 30% higher than if they were born to a negative use, so it's not zero, but again, it's the respiratory secretions as opposed to the milk and colostrum that are the biggest risk. Um, then we go back in um, uh, three to six months later and test again. We used to have a much wider um, time period, but we found that guys that would go out to eight months we're never getting rid of the disease because there were enough positive animals still in that flock that they were reinfecting animals. So we could never get, say, down below 12% uh, seroprevalence, just couldn't make it. Um, and that's not the goal. We want to get rid of the disease as much as we can. So if they're negative, then we go back in for the qualifying test for B status um, uh, a year later. And again, we give a very wide range because we're trying to avoid um, uh, late gestation, early lactation as much as we can, and uh, still testing those that are six months and older. And if they're negative, then they get B status. So now they've had two whole flock negative tests. Um, then they uh, qualify for A status, where we only test a proportion. I'll talk about the proportion in a second. And again, that's um, with you know six months to 13 months afterwards. And then um, they are A status uh, and they do an annual test. We used to have, um, for closed flocks, we used to say you could do every two years. And we ran into situations where closed flocks had a breakdown in biosecurity and it was too long till it was detected. And, they, um, and, and then the risks of, of uh, that disease spreading would become greater. And we also found that what one person thinks is a closed flock is not necessarily what the program thought. And, um, and so we thought, well, let's just get rid of that and have them tested every year. It's only fair. Um, and, and of course we test all new entries, as I mentioned before. So why do we only test a portion of the flock at A status? Well, it's too expensive to test every animal every time. Um, so we selected uh, 5%. We want to detect if the disease is present at greater than 5%, not zero, not one, not two, not 10. Um, and the reason we picked five was we know how contagious this virus is. So catching it there is better than um, catching it at 10 or 20%, particularly with produ production losses. 
it has to be random. We know sheep don't go down a chute randomly. We know that uh, when you go out and catch sheep, we, they certainly don't allow themselves to be caught randomly. So it has to be random so we get a clear and accurate picture of the flock. Um, it's not a direct proportion. It isn't like we go out there and test 25% because our intent is to find one positive, at least one positive. And so we have to test a higher proportion of a small flock than we would um, a large flock. So if I had 15 ewes, I might have to test 12 of them. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right number or not. But if I had 500 ewes, I might now only have to test 50 of them to find one infected one at 5%. So it's not a direct proportion. What about pooled samples? Um, when you pool, and it would be pooled at the lab, not, and you still have to test the animals, you lose sensitivity. And Quebec allows pooling, and it's been pretty hotly debated here in Ontario. Um, I don't make any of the decisions, but I can tell you, you make you miss positives when you do that. So if we do pooling, and I think we should, but that's not that's just me, then we should only do it when we really believe that the flock is negative, because there's too big a risk of missing infected animals. And we'd have to tit, we'd have to pull blood from a higher proportion of the flock because that loss of sensitivity. Um, so, and this, I think I was at uh, I sh uh, on Terra's sheep farmers meeting, although it was Osmo back then, when uh, in the food line, somebody said, why don't you have a program for us commercial, big commercial guys? And so we made this one. Um, and it's only useful if you believe you don't have mania in the flock. It will not get rid of it. And it started off by saying, well, we test um, animals that are only uh, that are a year of age because we're trying to find the infected ones. And we test that same random proportion, 5%. And that's the and that's and so if they're all negative, then you're monitored. If you're positive, you can't you you have no status because the program won't help you get rid of it. It'll identify you've got it in your flock, but that's it. And then we would encourage you to go to the whole flock program. If you're negative, then you do this um, random sample th in three years in a row, and you continue to be negative and you test all incoming animals, so you're not introducing it, the risk, um, sorry, the risk of your flock being infected is low. And so we call that monitored low risk. Again, it isn't zero, it's not equivalent to A status, but it is low risk. So for the commercial guy that doesn't wanna test, you know, 500 sheep, but he really believes he does not have the disease in his flock, then this is a way to get to a status that says, my flock is low risk for Mady Visna. Um, sorry. And again, you, and, and, oh, and uh, if you are monitored for low risk, then you can qualify for B status after one whole flock negative test. Um, so you can get more easily to A status. Again, if, you, if your flock's infected, it's not the program for you. So there are biosecurity requirements and they're almost all about animals. And uh, embryos and semen are pretty low risk. Sheep from A status flocks are not, are, are pretty low risk. They're not zero risk. Uh, sheep back from the show and tested negative twice are, are low risk, but a little higher risk than A status and so on down to where, you know, um, the, the, the highest risk are those that say go through a, uh, um, a sales barn or something like that, where the, the, the disease status of, of the other animals is unknown. Um, and as I mentioned, lambs born to positive use. If uh, we've we changed from requiring them to be marketed to recommending it, just because of uh, understanding risks associated with what those lambs are. What about flocks that can't afford to cull all the positives? And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but there are ways of uh, that are uh, we we can offer guidance in the program. It's not part of the program, but you can have flock two flocks of differing status as long as certain precautions are are made, like you keep them physically separate, uh, so there's no risk of transmission of the virus. It's not easy. Um, 
it's definitely not easy, but uh, for some guys that have the ability to house sheep of differing health statuses on this on the same property, or maybe you have two farms, then it's one way of not having to cull a bunch of sheep to slaughter, um, but running two flocks. Um, but we still recommend that you get rid of the positive flock as quickly as you can afford to do, because again, there's every there's risk of biosecurity breaks, particularly rams, you know, because you need to use rams in two flocks. The rams can certainly transmit it. Um, so is it worthwhile to enroll in a Made Business program? And I think the higher proportion of producers that are in it, particularly on the purebred side, the easier it is for everybody else so that it can source replacement animals of, of low risk status. Um, and, okay, maybe I'm out of time. I'll just stop right now. <laughs> so, and I, and I don't have any, up-to-date numbers, and I wish I had hot off the press numbers. I am retired, I am doing other things, but what I, I want to do is show the study we did a while back, Jim Fisher, who is at Kempville, that shows how long ago when Kempville was still running, um, uh, and I did an, a long time ago using data from Ontario producers that they gave us. And so a similar study could be done, I think it should be done. Uh, I'm not gonna do it, but if there's any animal health economists out there putting up their hand that wanna do it, I'd love it to happen. But um, so the numbers are, are, are probably not helpful because, you know, they're pretty old. But this just shows you the kinds of costs associated with the program that were part of how we estimated the economic input. So ear tags, registration, um, education, lab charges per test, when well, we know that's no longer $2.50. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that, laughed. It's, um, so, so the numbers would need to be changed, but the idea is there. And then we looked at what the returns were, and this would be value of the animal. And with the purebred guys, we said, we asked them to say, um, how much more could you sell a replacement animal for if you were negative, like the status itself versus not having that status. So they gave me that to us, what they estimated. These are people on the program. I, in red there, I put up the, this is where that uh, 11 pounds or 4.95 kilos of lost productivity goes in, which to me is really important to have those kinds of understanding of those numbers. Um, and again, these are healthy sheep. So um, what we found, and again, the numbers are less important than the direction of these data that we found that for the purebred guy who thought he was selling his replacement stock for more money than if they were not matey on the matey program, um, their, their return was, was pretty quick after they achieved negative status or a status. And uh, even at the $15 for tests, now that's much higher now, I, I know that. Um, but uh, again, so are the value of the animals. Um, so that would be not irrespective of the amount of disease in the flock, but in addition to the amount of disease in the flock, they were getting a benefit. So then the question is, well, what about a commercial guy? Because to me, it's I, I want the purebred guys on the program, clearly, but we also need to show a benefit to the, to the commercial guy where they're not selling breeding stock. They're selling uh, market lambs. And so that's where that, um, that uh, 11 pounds comes in. And, uh, and of course, at 10% zero prevalence, we found that yes, they made the money back. Uh, took a while. Um, in our estimate, it was five to nine years, uh, depending on uh, the other inputs. But, um, but they started making money because they weren't losing money to the lost productivity. Um, so as I mentioned before, on average, 20 to 40% is what we see in our studies. So the economic returns are likely there even for the commercial guy not selling breeding stock. Of course, if the commercial guy doesn't have Medivisna, there's no benefit, right? But that's the big caveat. And of course, with our dairy producers, 
the value of the milk is a, another thing that needs to be looked at. And certainly Mativism is quite common around the world in the dairy industry. And, um, uh, and so it's, it's got to be, it's, it should be a target disease for eradication or sorry, I shouldn't ever use that word for, for achieving low risk status. So they're not losing money to something that they don't have to. So in summary, it's very common. It's, it's very contagious. It causes loss, mark losses of productivity, even when the sheep appear healthy. The testing protocols can assist in producers in removing infected sheep and improving the health of the flock. It can move to a low risk status. Um, we do need more studies and economic returns with more up-to-date information um, and questions. <laughs>